Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Jeff Gambrone uh, bringing you the first episode of the Mississippi History Channel. This is a new uh, endeavor on my part. Uh, I've had a Civil War uh, in Mississippi uh, uh, channel for a while now, but I found I had a lot of stories I wanted to tell that uh, come from different eras of the state's history. So I thought I would uh, make a new uh, channel just for everything other than the Civil War. And I thought, what better uh, subject for the first episode than Mississippi in World War II? This is a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, my father, Joseph T. Gambrone, served in World War II. Uh, he was uh, a sergeant in the 18th Mechanized Cavalry. And uh, he graduated from high school in uh, May of uh, 1944 was drafted uh, in July of 1944, and by the end of the year found himself on a troop ship uh, headed to Europe. And uh, uh, his, uh, his adventures uh, in Europe in late 44 and uh, through the end of 45 were quite memorable and I think had quite an impact on the rest of his life. But uh, I've always had a, a deep interest in World War II, and uh, I just thought I'd share uh, a little background on how the war uh, affected the state of Mississippi. And to begin with, in 1940, the attention of Mississippians uh, was being drawn to Europe and news of the, of the ongoing war that was rapidly becoming a, a worldwide conflict. And historian John R. Skates, Jr. Uh, wrote about how the state citizens uh, reacted to uh, news of the conflict in, uh, in the, the newspapers. He said, Yet the events which dominated the news in the first months of 1940 and lurked at least in the backs of the minds of most Mississippians were occurring in Europe. In January, the Russo-Finnish Winter War and in April, May, and June, Hitler's Blitzkrieg of Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, and France. The war had not yet begun for the United States, but in fact, the faraway events in Europe were already affecting the lives of the people of Mississippi. And this is very true. And th this is the kind of thing uh, that Mississippians were reading. This is the headlines from the Daily Clarion Ledger, uh, May 13, 1940. Nazi push unhalted, losses on both sides terrific in new battles. And I think most, uh, most astute Mississippians realized that uh, the United States was not going to be able to stay out of this war for very long. And, uh, and what was happening in Europe was very soon going to affect Mississippians and people uh, across the, the United States. And because of the alarming events in Europe, Military mobilization came to Mississippi in the fall of 1940, when the United States began the first peacetime draft in the nation's history. Under the Selective Service uh, Training and Service Act, all males between the ages of 21 to 36 were required to register for the draft. The lottery system determined who would be called into service, and nearly 260,000 Mississippians appeared before Selective Service Boards in the state to register for the draft. This was a very sizable portion of the state's citizens. Uh, the 1940 U.S. Census had put the population of Mississippi at only uh, 2,183,796. So uh, this was this was a I mean a large portion of the state's population. Um, the draft lottery was held in Mississippi in October 1940 to determine who would be called uh, to military duty. And uh, these are a couple of, uh, of illustrations that I pulled from the uh, Clarion Ledger from September 2nd, 1940. Um, and on the left is a little chart that was explaining to Mississippians how the draft would work. And on the right is a photo from the same paper uh, showing uh, the, the swearing in of draft registration officials for Hines County, Mississippi. This is the county that uh, my father lived in, and he would eventually go before a draft board in Raymond, Mississippi. Some of the first Mississippians to serve uh, in the uh, during World War II were the 3,681 officers and men of the Mississippi National Guard. They were accepted into federal service on November 25, 1940, and uh, assigned to Camp Blanding, Florida. 
And uh, these are two ads that were published in the Clarion Ledger, uh, no November 24, 1940, uh, praising the, the patriotism of those National Guardsmen who were going off to serve uh, outside the state. And the need for a draft became painfully apparent on December 7, 1941, uh, when the Empire of Japan attacked the United States uh, Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. In this attack, 30 Mississippi servicemen were killed, uh, the first of many from the state uh, that would die in the war. 25 of these men were uh, Navy personnel uh, stationed on ships docked it at Pearl Harbor. In addition, there were five Mississippians uh, killed in the Army Air Corps who were stationed at Hickam and Wheeler Fields. And shown here on the top left, uh, this was the uh, headline from the Clarion Ledger, December 8, 1941. Japanese declare war on U.S. and Britain. New wave of bombers hit at Hawaii. U.S. planes on guard over Manila. And this picture is of uh, Eugene Denson of Canton, Mississippi. He was killed at Hickam Field December 7, 1941, while trying to set up a machine gun. In response to the Japanese attack, uh, the United States declared war on that country uh, December 8, 1941. Italy declared war on the United States on December 11th, and the U.S. responded uh, in kind that same day by declaring war on those countries. Uh, this headline is from the Greenwood Commonwealth at December 11th, 1941, and the headline to the right here is from the same paper, uh, December 12th, 1941. So Mississippians were going to be called up uh, very quickly uh, in the wake of the December 7th attack, and many more were going to volunteer for service. And during the war, Mississippians were going to serve in every branch of the United States military and in every theater of the conflict. Uh, exact numbers are a little difficult to determine, but approximately 240,000 Mississippians served in uniform, uh, both men and women, during the war. Uh, this was about 11% of the state's population. And uh, this picture I chose, uh, this is the uh, War Memorial Building in uh, Jackson. It was uh, built in the 1930s to commemorate uh, Mississippi's uh, dead from World War I, but in time it would also come to commemorate those who died in World War II and other conflicts as well. And the, the Clarion Ledger and basically every newspaper in, in the state had a, uh, a war column to basically keep up with the goings-on of locals who were serving in, uh, in the, the uniform during the war. And articles like these were very common during the war years because people wanted to know what was happening with their friends, neighbors, and relatives. So you see lots of, of articles about what uh, individual soldiers in a given community were doing during the war. Uh, and these pictures are from the Clarion Ledger, uh, September 28, 1945. Now, a lot of Mississippians uh, uh, did become casualties during the war. Uh, during the World War II, 3,555 Mississippians who served in the Army and the Army Air Corps became casualties. Of that number, uh, 1,848 were killed. 298 died of wounds received in combat, 12 died of non-combat injuries, and 207 were missing and presumed dead. And then there were 16 that were missing and unaccounted for. Uh, casualties for Mississippians serving in the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard came to a total of 1,616. Of that number, 601 were killed in combat, 22 died in prison camps, Nine were missing, uh, 904 were wounded in combat, and 80 were taken prisoner and released at the end of the war. And shown in this illustration is my Aunt Joy, uh, along with her husband, uh, Homer Chancellor, and their two children. Homer uh, was lost on May 10, 1945, when his Navy bomber went down in the Pacific. Some of the crew of his plane survived, but unfortunately, uh, Homer did not. Uh, my aunt later wrote a letter to one of the uh, one of the pilots of the plane that uh, that Homer was in and uh, this is what she said to him in her letter she said 
Answer my questions the best you can, please, Lieutenant. There have been spinning around in my head unanswered so there have been spinning around in my head unanswered so long it's almost driving me crazy. I can face whatever is to come with the help of the Lord, Lieutenant Crocker, but I'm afraid I can't accept the opinion that Homer is dead until there is some proof or time tells its own story. I have the faith you spoke of in your letter, but it's faith that somewhere, somehow, in the face of it all, God has not failed to answer my prayers and those of our babies. Unfortunately, uh, Homer never came home. Um, my Aunt Joy never really got any, uh, any confirmation of his death. His body was never found. And uh, I don't know that my aunt really ever reconciled herself to his death. Uh, she never remarried. And uh, I still have very fond memories of her. She was a great lady. And, and I, I miss her very much. But uh, this article announcing uh, uh, Homer Chancellor's uh, uh, status as missing in action is from the Clarion Ledger, uh, August 16th, 1945. And unfortunately, such notices were all too common during the war years. Now, during World War II, a number of Mississippians were recipients of the Medal of Honor. And I could not find a, a uh, uh, Medal of Honor certificate for a Mississippian, that, uh, but I did find this, uh, this one for uh, a gentleman from another state, Staff Sergeant Jonah E. Kelly just to give you an idea of what one looks like. And uh, this is the Medal of Honor. And uh, during World War II, seven Mississippians were recipients of the Medal of Honor, uh, the United States' highest award for valor uh, in combat. Five of these men were in the Army, uh, Van T. Barfoot, uh, James H. Diamond, Robert T. Henry, uh, Jake W. Lindsay, and uh, James D. Slayton. Uh, the awards to Diamond and Henry were both made posthumously as they were both killed in action. Uh, one Medal of Honor recipient was in the Navy, uh, Commander Donald A. Gary. He had been born in Ohio, uh, but was living in Mississippi when the war started, and his Medal of Honor was credited to the Magnolia State. Uh, there was also one Medal of Honor recipient uh, from Mississippi in the Marine Corps, uh, Captain Lewis Hugh Wilson, Jr., and just to give you a, an idea of the kind of valor that uh, it took to become a recipient of the Medal of Honor, uh, this is Vanty Barfoot, uh, who was from Carthage, Mississippi. He was the last surviving Mississippi Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. He passed away in 2012. He was serving as a sergeant in the 157th Infantry Regiment, part of the 45th Infantry Division, when he was awarded the Medal of Honor. And just to read you uh, some of his Medal of Honor citation, this, this will give you an idea of just the kind of valor that was involved. Uh, for conspicuous gallantry uh, and risk of life above and beyond the call of duty on 23rd May 1944 near Carano, Italy, with his platoon heavily engaged during an assault against forces well entrenched on commanding ground, 2nd Lieutenant Barfoot, then technical sergeant, moved off alone upon the enemy left flank. He crawled to the proximity of one machine gun nest and made a direct hit on it with a hand grenade, killing two and wounding three Germans. He continued along the German defense line to another machine gun emplacement and with his Tommy gun killed two and captured three soldiers. Members of another enemy machine gun crew then abandoned their position and gave themselves up to Sergeant Barfoot. Leaving the prisoners for his support squad to pick up, He proceeded to mop up positions in the immediate area, capturing more prisoners and bringing his total count to 17. Later that day, after he had reorganized his men and consolidated the newly captured ground, the enemy launched a fierce armored counterattack directly at his platoon positions. Securing a bazooka, Sergeant Barfoot took up an exposed position directly in front of three advancing Mark VI tanks. This is a, a Mark VI. This is a Tiger tank. This is the kind of tank he was facing. Uh, from a distance of 75 yards, his first shot destroyed the track of the leading tank, effectively disabling it, while the other two changed direction toward the flank. As the crew of the disabled tank dismounted, Sergeant Barfoot killed three of them with his Tommy gun. He then continued forward into enemy terrain and destroyed a recently abandoned German field piece with a demolition charge placed in the breach. 
While returning to his platoon position, Sergeant Barfoot, though greatly fatigued with it by his Herculean efforts, assisted two of his seriously wounded men 1,700 yards to a position of safety. Sergeant Barfoot's extraordinary heroism, demonstration of magnificent valor, and aggressive determination in the face of point-blank fire are a perpetual inspiration to his fellow soldiers. And I have to agree with that, because that's, that's just uh, an incredible display of, of bravery, uh, taking on uh, what he did and surviving. And another example uh, is Technical Sergeant Jake W. Lindsay, who was from Waynesboro, Mississippi. He received his Medal of Honor on May 21, 1945, in front of a joint session of Congress, and his, was, his medal was presented by Harry Truman uh, to commemorate the 100th Infantryman to receive the award. Uh, this was the only occasion in which the Medal of Honor was thus presented to a recipient. And uh, it's just uh, another case of, of, of um, amazing bravery. Uh, his citation uh, reads, uh, For gallantry at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty on September on, uh, 16 November 1944 in Germany, Technical Sergeant Lindsay assumed a position about 10 yards to the front of his platoon during an intense enemy infantry tank counterattack and by his unerringly accurate fire, destroyed two enemy machine gun nests, forced the withdrawal of two tanks, and effectively halted enemy flanking patrols. Later, although painfully wounded, he engaged eight Germans who were re-establishing machine gun positions in hand-to-hand -hand combat, killing three, capturing three, and causing the other two to flee. By his gallantry, Technical Sergeant Lindsay secured his unit's position and reflected great credit upon himself and the United States Army. And uh, I would have to agree with that. Uh, it's just an incredible display of, uh, of uh, soldiering. Now, during World War II, 20 native Mississippians served as generals in the United States Army, and one, uh, Luther Stevens, served as a general in the Philippine Army. Uh, there were three lieutenant generals, uh, Daniel I. Sultan, uh, Charles P. Hall, and Troy H. Middleton. There were three major generals, uh, Spencer B. Aiken, Fulton Q. C. Gardner, and Ralph H. Wooten. And then there were 14 brigadier generals, uh, James E. Bayless, William E. Brauher, uh, Charles D. W. Uh, Canham, uh, C. W. Hartman, George E. Hartman, uh, John W. Lang, W. A. McCain, uh, John T. Murray, Isaac W. Ott, Alexander Paxton Jr., James E. Pickering, Howard K. Ramey, Ira P. Swift, and William R. Woodward. Of these men, uh, one was killed, uh, Brigadier General Howard K. Ramey, who was uh, uh, killed on New Guinea. Uh, two were captured, uh, Brigadier General William Brauher on Bataan, and Brigadier General Luther R. Stevens in the Philippines. And so, some of the most prominent generals uh, from Mississippi during the, the course of the war were these gentlemen. Lieutenant General Troy H. Middleton of Hazelhurst. He commanded the 45th Infantry Division in North Africa and Italy, and he later led the 8th Army Corps in the European Theater of Operations. Next is Lieutenant General Daniel I. Sultan of Oxford. He was the commanding general of the Burma India Theater of Operations. And then third, uh, Lieutenant General Charles P. Hall, Hall of Sardis. He commanded the 11th Army Corps in the Pacific. And then uh, Mississippians were also represented in the highest levels of the U United States Navy. Uh, shown here is Rear Admiral uh, Ivan E. Bass. This is a photo taken early in his naval career. Uh, he had a very long and distinguished career in the United States Navy. Uh, he was promoted to Rear Admiral in 1934. He retired in August 1941, but after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, he requested a return to active duty. Uh, during the war, he, stirs, uh, he served stateside on the Compensation Board and later uh, in the Bureau of Ships uh, Settlement Review Board. Uh, Admiral Bass retired for the second time on October 22, 1947, after 50 years of active duty in the military. And then probably the most prominent Mississippian to serve as an admiral during World War II was John S. McCain from Carroll County. 
Uh, military service was very popular in the McCain family. Uh, John's brother William was a Brigadier General during World War II. Uh, his uncle Henry P. McCain was a Major General during World War I. Uh, John S. McCain was promoted to Rear Admiral in 1941 and to Vice Admiral in 1943. Uh, during the war, he led Carrier Task Force 38 in the Pacific, and planes from his uh, command took part in the battles over Peleliu, Leyte Gulf, uh, the Philippine Sea, uh, Mindanao, uh, Luzon, Formosa, uh, and the Japanese home islands. In three months of furious combat in 1945, McCain's uh, command destroyed uh, 6,000 Japanese aircraft and 2 million tons of Japanese shipping, including approximately 100 warships. McCain witnessed the Japanese surrender on board the USS Missouri September 2, 1945, and unfortunately died four days later of a heart attack. After his uh, untimely death, uh, Mississippi Representative Jamie L. Witten and Senator John C. Stennis sponsored a bill uh, to make McCain a full admiral as of September 6, 1945, the day of his death. Uh, the bill passed, making John S. McCain only the second Mississippian to reach the rank of full admiral in the United States Navy. And uh, this is a picture of uh, tax, Task Force 38 that McCain led during the war. And I'd like to read uh, a little bit of an article that was published in the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, McCain wrote this article, and it described what it was like to be a commander and watch your men go off to fight, uh, or having to send his pilots off to fight. And he wrote in this article, To those of us who have to stay with the ships, a carrier strike is the melodrama in which the curtain rises only for the first scene of the first act and the last scene of the last act. We know nothing of the taut seconds when our planes peel off to plunge down against their targets through the swirling clouds of shell bursts. We know nothing of the tension that they, when they're, where they turn and dive and climb like winged rockets in the full throttle rush of the dogfight. He's a very eloquent man. And then a third admiral from Mississippi was Aaron S. Merrill who was born in 1890 in Natchez. He was promoted to Rear Admiral on February 11, 1943. Uh, Merrill was notable as a cruiser, destroyer, and task force commander. Uh, the most famous of his exploits was the Battle of Empress Augusta Bay on November 1st, 2nd, uh, 1943, in which the destroyers and cruisers under his command defeated a powerful Japanese naval force sent to drive the Americans from the Solomon Islands. And in fact, this is a picture taken during that battle of uh, Empress Augusta Bay. Um, Merrill retired on November 1st, 1947 at the rank of Vice Admiral. Now, for every general or admiral in, uh, serving in the uh, armed forces during the war, there were thousands of Mississippians uh, from the rank of private up to colonel serving in war zones all over the world. And it's through uh, you know, letters and diaries of these men that you can really gain a, a real insight into what the war was like for ordinary Mississippians. Uh, one of these Mississippians was Andrew C. Leach, who was born in Itawamba County and enlisted in the U.S. Army on October 5, 1942. He was assigned to the 83rd Chemical Mortar Battalion, and in his diary, Leach described his introduction to combat during the invasion of Sicily in 1943. This is what he wrote. Just before the first wave hit the coastal batteries opened fire on them and machine guns began to rattle all around. We were all standing up in line in our compartment waiting for the signal to disembark. We had on full packs and equipment and all the ammunition we could carry plus three days rations. We really looked like pack mules and I was so sick and weak I could hardly stand up. But we stood there waiting, a minute seemed like hours, as we listened to the machine guns and big guns. This was our first experience of shell fire, and we just stood there and waited, knowing in a few minutes it would be our time to rush out into that hail of fire and do our bit. Now, a number of Mississippians uh, were captured uh, during the course of the war and spent time in a prisoner of war camp. Uh, one example was uh, Bodine Green of Amory, who was serving in the U.S. Army in France uh, when the Germans captured him in 1944. <clears throat> he, 
And in an interview, he described his journey to Stalag uh, 7A in Bavaria, where he would remain until the war ended. And this is a picture of Stalag 7A. And he wrote, at the end of the long march, the Germans then loaded us onto railroad trains. The boxcars were marked for 60 men or 40 cows. They packed us into these boxcars and we had standing room only. It was so cramped in these cars that we would have to sleep in relays. Some men could lie down for... <coughs> Excuse me. Some men could lie down for a little while and sleep while others had just enough room to stand up. We would usually change sleeping shifts on the floor every hour or so. This was the way we rode all the way to, into Munich, Germany. We were then sent from Munich out to Mooseburg, just outside Munich. Mooseburg is where our prison camp was. It was named Stalag 7A. I spent nine months in this prison camp. Every day we were loaded on a train and sent into Munich to work on repairing bomb damage to the city and to the railroad. Now, some Mississippians joined the Army Air Corps and fought the enemy in the air. Uh, the, first Miss the first American serving in United States uniform to shoot down a German fighter uh, was Lieutenant Samuel F. Junkin of Natchez. On August 19, 1942, he shot down an FW-190 fighter over Dieppe, France, but he was wounded in this fight and had to bail out over the English Channel. He was rescued from the water and, was, and later married the Canadian nurse who took care of him in the hospital. Uh, shown at top left is Lieutenant uh, Junkin being presented with the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Purple Heart. Uh, and then the article is from the uh, Evening Review of Ohio, August 27, 1942. Junkin was part of the 31st Fighter Group, uh, 309th Squadron, and they flew uh, British Spitfires. And in fact, uh, the photo in the bottom left here is a photo of his unit uh, in their Spitfires. Another uh, Mississippi Airman was William H. Johnson of Decatur, Mississippi, who served as a bombardier in the 381st Bomb Group, 533rd Bomb Squadron. In fact, this is their, their squadron insignia. And he wrote about one mission to Osher, I do not know how to pronounce this, Oschersleben, Germany, that occurred on January 11, 1944. And he wrote, In my bombardier's car compartment in the nose of my plane, I had twin 50 caliber machine guns and 1,150 rounds of ammunition. German fighters were everywhere, coming right through the middle of our formation, uh, coming, uh, some coming so close you could see the whites of the pilot's eyes. B-17s were on fire and falling all around, uh, all around together with a large number of German fighters that our group shot down. A number of my close friends were killed on that one mission. I shot every round of my ammunition before we were able to get out of Germany. My squadron was the hardest hit of the two groups. Out of 12 planes in the two groups, the 533rd lost eight. And uh, shown in this picture, uh, that's Lieutenant Johnson posing in front of his B-17 that was named the, uh, the Martha II. And then another uh, prominent Mississippi pilot uh, during World War II was Alwyn Max Uheim of Grenada, uh, who became a U.S. Army Air Force's ace. Uh, he was credited with shooting down nine enemy aircraft in uh, aerial combat. Uh, while engaging enemy aircraft on May 28, 1944, uh, the lieutenant suffered a head-on collision with a P-51 fighter, uh, also an another United States aircraft. Uh, the Mustang pilot was killed, but uh, Lieutenant Jochheim managed to parachute to the ground where he was captured and held a prisoner of war for the next year. He left after active duty after the war, but remained in the Air Force Reserves for several years. And this is another picture of uh, Lieutenant uh, Juchheim with his P-47 uh, fighter. And then in addition to the men who fought from the Magnolia State, Mississippi also had a namesake ship that took part in World War II, the USS Mississippi BB-41. Uh, the Mississippi was a 32,000 ton battleship mounting 12 14-inch guns with a crew complement of 1,081. 
commissioned in 1917. Uh, she didn't see any action in World War I, but she certainly made up for it during World War II. Uh, Mississippians were very proud of the ship that bore their, uh, the name of their state, and on December 7, 1946, uh, the Clarion Ledger said of the USS Mississippi, quote, she provided effective fire uh, support for our troops on the Okinawa beaches and climaxed her career by the brilliant three-day bombardment of the most strongly fortified position encountered in the Pacific War. Her day is done. The day of her kind, the day of the battleship, may be done. She is headed for the scrap pile, but her name will long glow brightly in the naval annals, and many Mississippians, including men who served aboard her, would like it better could she be sunk with flag flying. And this is a picture from the Clarion Ledger of uh, the of William H. Boggs of Jackson, who was serving on board uh, the USS Mississippi. And this is just an, uh, uh, an example of the, the history of the, the Mississippi during World War II. She earned eight battle stars for her World War II service. And uh, it's a shame uh, that uh, this ship was not preserved. In fact, she was offered to the state of Mississippi uh, after the war for use as a museum ship, and I wish the state had taken her. Uh, she could be like the, you know, the U.S. Alabama is today uh, down in Mobile. Uh, it's just a, it's a, a shame she was not preserved. Uh, the, in fact, the only part of her I know that survived, the ship's bell is, uh, is on display down in Natchez. But unfortunately, the, ship, uh, her, the brave ship herself is long gone. But uh, this concludes my little talk. This is just a very simple overview on uh, Mississippi and World War II. I plan on doing some follow-up uh, uh, videos on uh, going into more detail about Mississippi's contribution during World War II, particularly uh, talking about the home front. But uh, if you like this, uh, this uh, uh, episode, please give it a like and subscribe to my new channel. That's really only, the only way I can gauge how much interest there is in, in doing more of these videos. So... Uh, uh, Please uh, let me know your comments. If you've got any questions, let me know. And uh, thank you so much for watching.